Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. For 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them was hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Once four pastors, they were staying together in a cabin for a few days. And one evening during these few days, they decided that they would share with one another what their biggest temptations were. The first pastor said, well, it's kind of embarrassing, but my big temptation is bad pictures. Once I even bought a copy of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. My temptation is worse, the second pastor said. It's gambling. One Saturday night, instead of preparing my sermon, I went to the racetrack to bet on ponies. Mine is worse still, the third pastor says. I sometimes can't control the urge to drink. One time I actually broke into the communion wine. The fourth pastor, he was quiet. Men, I hate to say this, but my temptation is worst of all. I love to gossip, and if you guys will excuse me, I have a few phone calls I'd like to go make. (laughs) Funny, but true, right? We all have something in our lives that tempts us, and the world is full of people who are ready to tempt us to try to pull us away from what God says is right, to try to pull us away from God. And today we're going to talk about someone who tried to tempt Jesus himself, and how Jesus responded. Now, Pastor Peter Sapp, whom I'm sure a lot of you probably know personally, once made a joke saying how he wondered if Jesus was actually Mary and Joseph's third or fourth child. Now, obviously, he wasn't being serious about this, but he was pointing out how little there is in the Bible about Jesus' life as a child. He said how when Caleb was born, they took a picture of every breath Caleb took. And then when Jana came... They took maybe about half as many pictures. You know, maybe they'd take a picture, you know, when she'd fall down so they could show her one day how clumsy she was. Although she's just about as clumsy as she was then, so I don't know if she actually needs those pictures. And then when Leah finally came around, they'd seen it all. They saw all the boy stuff. They saw all the girl stuff. And there was really nothing that new, so very little pictures were taken. Now Leah makes up for that by taking thousands of selfie pictures on her parents' camera that look like this. <laughs> But that's why uh, he joked about whether Jesus was the fourth child, because the more and more people have kids, the less and less pictures they take. And in the Bible, when we read about Jesus, we have the birth of Jesus, right? And then after the birth of Jesus, we have a story in Luke, and that's right, I said one single story of Luke, uh, where Jesus is a child in the temple. And then Shazam! He's a 30-year-old. But no, uh, Jesus uh, was not the fourth child, and he did not just morph into a 30-year-old. The actual reason for this is because in the culture at that time, you weren't considered to have reached manhood until you were 30 years old. So until then, Jesus couldn't publicly preach or perform miracles because nobody would have bothered listening. So we're finally here, and Jesus has reached 30 years old, and the real story begins. Jesus begins his ministry by getting baptized by John the Baptist and announcing the one he's been preaching about has finally arrived. And then immediately, Jesus heads off into the desert to prove he is worthy, and that is where our story specifically picks up today. So we have Jesus heading out on his 40-day journey of isolation. And the Bible says that he ate nothing during those days. At the, end of, and at the end of his journey, he was hungry. Now you guys know that 
I tend to find some humor in scripture from time to time, but seriously, I cannot get through one entire night without making like six Unimart trips. So yeah, after 40 days without food, I'm thinking Jesus was a little bit hungry. But there's someone with Jesus during his journey as we read on. The devil is tempting Jesus every step of the way. And I'm sure it's just me, but every time I read in scripture that the God, that God and the devil are in direct contact with one another, I can't help but get overwhelmed with the sense of epicness to these encounters. You guys are going to laugh at me, but I picture a scene from an episode of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And in this episode, spoilers, Jeremy, in this episode, Lord Zed, the main villain, enters the base of the Power Rangers and is face-to-face with their noble leader, Lord er, Zordon. And as Lord Zed enters the command center, the entire interior of the building begins to shake. And you can just feel the tension that is in the room when these two are in the same place together. As a kid, when I saw that, my jaw dropped. And maybe it's just the child in me, but when I read stories in the Bible, when Jesus is talking directly to the devil, the epitome of both good and evil staring each other right in the eye, I immediately feel my heart begin to race a bit because this is more than just any Bible story. This isn't even big. It's huge. So we see the devil tempting Jesus over the course of these 40 days, and I think this is key. Because I think from time to time when we read the story, we read about these three temptations and we think that was it. Yeah, uh, the devil has Jesus all by himself for 40 days and he's only going to tempt him three times. For those of you who are interested, that would be one temptation every 13 days. Trust me guys, I'm pretty sure the devil's not that bad at tempting. That'd be like if Wiley Coyote was trying to tempt Jesus. Oh no, Jesus got away again saying beep, beep, and Wiley has to come up with another plan. It's going to take him another two weeks to come up with something. And it probably won't be very good anyways. Point is, the devil is far better than that. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely sin more than twice in a month. Heck, I'm lucky if, if, I don't, if I'm not stupid twice in one minute, let alone an entire month. So take that and apply it to Jesus' situation. What is at stake whenever we're tempted to sin? Our relationship with God, right? Because when we sin, that sin separates us from God and it pushes us away from him. Now, what's at stake whenever Jesus is tempted to sin? Our salvation, right? The salvation of every single one of us. God's entire mission to try to save us fails right then and there. Game over. Because Jesus cannot pay the price of our sins if he owes it himself. And he can't save people from their sin if he's a sinner too. With all of that to consider and the obvious fact that the devil can get Jesus, if he can just get Jesus to sin just once, one time, he wins. Do you really think he's only going to give it a shot three times? Like, oh, yeah, I'll give this tempting Jesus thing a few tries, and if it doesn't work out, well, you know, YOLO. No! This is one of the best chances the devil is ever going to get. He's pulling out all the stops. He's going all in to try to take down Jesus with everything he's got. But instead of looking at this entire long list of all these temptations that the devil threw at Jesus, we get a close-up look at three of his worst. In the first attempt listed in the Bible, the devil comes to Jesus and says, If you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, at first, this might not seem so bad because Jesus has to be hungry, right? I mean, Scripture already told us that. Can't the guy have something to eat? But let me explain what the devil is really doing here. You see, as we said before, Jesus is out in the desert for 40 days without food or water. Now, admittingly, we don't know when exactly in the timeline the devil was tempting Jesus with this, but we know he makes it 40 days. Is that humanly possible? To go 40 days without food or water? We'd be dead. But obviously, God is sustaining Jesus through his journey. So when the devil is tempting Jesus, he's not merely tempting him with hunger, but he was tempting Jesus' trust in God to get him through. And it's also interesting how the devil phrases this temptation. If you are the son of God. It's not that the devil doubted who Christ was, but he's attempting to tempt Jesus with his own power. You are powerful enough. You don't need the Father. You have your own power to satisfy your need. 
This could even be foreshadowing to when Christ was on the cross and was mocked, if you are the king of the Jews, then save yourself. But what does Jesus do in response? He says, it is written, man does not live by bread alone. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, which says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So Jesus is saying, no, my trust lies in the Father. He's going to get me through, and he is going to provide for me. So Jesus won, and the devil zip. But the devil tries again. This time, he leads Jesus up to a high place and shows Jesus a vision of every single kingdom, saying to Jesus, I will give you all the authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Now this sounds more like the devil that I am familiar with, because they both know the plan, right? All the authority will be under, uh, all the kingdoms will be under the authority of Jesus. But first, he has to die on the cross, right? He has to sacrifice himself to the world. And I could see the devil clear as day, almost slithering up behind Jesus' ear, whispering a way out. Saying, you can have all of this, I can give it to you. Without pain and without death. This is what the devil is best at because he knows the things that we desire. And he knows how to make bad things look good. Really good. He gets into our head and says, oh, it's, it's not that bad. If you want it, you should have it. You should do it. He's saying to Jesus, you'll get everything, Jesus. You don't have to die. Just bow down and worship me. Sounds tempting. Jesus gets to fix the world without dying. But if he does this, people's lives on earth might be better. But we're still going to hell. So again, we see Jesus respond by saying, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus is again quoting scripture to the devil. And now, we've had the final attempt listening to scripture, the last try recorded of the devil trying to get Jesus to slip up. Scripture says this time the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. As he says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, he says, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now we see here the devil is getting very clever because he is, flips Jesus' weapon against him. The devil is now quoting scripture to Jesus, specifically Psalm 91. He's not only tempting Jesus with his own power again, but he says to prove it. You say you're the son of God? Show me. If Jesus gives in, this basically means that it's not enough for God to tell us that something is true. He has to prove it to us. You have to prove it to me before I believe you. I have to physically feel the holes in your hands to believe, if you get the reference. But if God has to prove everything to you, then where's your faith? Faith is believing in the unseen, not what you force God to prove to you, as if he owes us anyways. And then one final time, Jesus replies to the devil, the final blow. Jesus replies again from Deuteronomy. It says, do not put your Lord God to the test. And with that, the devil finally gives up, for now anyways. And Jesus has passed the test. I'm sure Jesus is praising God because he finally gets some food and water. But there are two very important things I think we can get from this passage of Scripture. Things that we can learn. The first is that just because we have Christ in our lives does not mean that the Holy Spirit will always lead us to calm and safe places without temptation. We see here, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the heart of temptation. To face it. To look it dead in the eyes. Not to just prove he was human. Not to just undo what Adam did years and years and years before in Genesis. But to overcome temptation himself. 
See, God doesn't want us to just simply avoid temptation. He wants us to overcome it. And God will sometimes lead us into places in our lives that will tempt us, test us, places that will stretch our faith so that we can bounce back stronger and like Jesus, overcome. Secondly, I think we can take from this scripture how to overcome. We see Jesus, the Son of God, the most clever and powerful person to ever walk on the face of the earth. And how does he respond? Not with a bolt of lightning, not with some magic spell. He's not flexing his muscles, showing us how strong he is. He did it with scripture, with the word of God. Too often, we simply try to overcome our temptation with our own strength. How's that working out for you? We try to dig our heels in and grit our teeth, but too often, we just can't do it. We see Jesus being tempted with the same kind of things we're tempted with, right? Physical needs and desires, possessions and power and pride. And what do we see Jesus Christ himself fall back on? God's word. It never wavers and it never fails. So the next time Satan tries to pull you away from God, stop trying to be a macho man because God has already given you the ultimate weapon. In Ephesians 6.17, it's even referenced as an offensive weapon to a Christian's armor. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So take your sword. Memorize scripture to use in battle against him. Use it to fight back when he tempts you. Because although he's good, and he is good, God's word is ultimately far more powerful. Send that wily coyote off with his tail between his legs to fail another day. Just like Jesus overcame his trials by throwing back scripture at the devil, you can too. One verse at a time. Because just one verse of God's word can make all the difference. So the next time the devil comes creeping into your life and starts to whisper gently in your ear, what are you going to say back? Let's pray.